G'day, how you going? Welcome to Bootlosophy and my name is Tech. I come to you from Wajuk country in Western Australia and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. Today, I'm going at it hammer and anvil looking at the red winged blacksmith in Copper Rough and Tough. This is the Red Wing Blacksmith Boot, model 3343 in copper rough and tough oil tanned leather. It's made by Red Wing Shoes, which was founded in 1905 and based in Red Wing, Minnesota in the USA. Red Wing is a huge company with a huge range of models, and not just in their heritage range, but also in their modern technical work boots range, uh, but also across other brands that they own as well, such as Works, that's spelt with an X, uh, Irish Setter and Vask. Now, I don't really care where their boots are made as long as they are well made. But for those of you who do care, their heritage boots, like the blacksmith, continue to be made in America. In 1987, Red Wing became an even more vertically integrated company by buying SB Foot Tanning, which had itself been around since 1872. Red Wing now tan their own hides, own the factories that make the boots, own their own retail stores in America and sell around the world through agents and franchise retailers. You can guess from this that Red Wing is actually a huge company. They rank in the top 50 largest private companies in Minnesota with revenue estimates of around 570 million US dollars a year and they have about 1600 employees. The Blacksmith model is uh, similar to the famous Iron Ranger without the toe cap uh, and some other differences like the roll top of the collar and the different backstay shape. While it comes in a variety of different uppers, this model number 3343 comes in copper rough and tough, which is one of their best sellers. It's a plain toe work boot design, six inches high from the heels to the top of the shaft, uh, Goodyear welted for recraftability, rubber Vibram sole, and a solid rubber Vibram block heel. It uses the same red wing number eight last as the Iron Ranger, which means it has this bulbous toe box shape and takes on an immediate work boot aesthetic, especially in this copper rough and tough leather, which just adopts patina like there's no tomorrow. If you're new to boots, I'll explain some of the terms I've used like last, uh, Goodyear welting, Vibram, and patina. I'll explain all that later on. For now, looking at the style of the boot, it's clearly a casual boot, more manual work related than the newer service boot designs that you can easily wear to a professional office. Particularly in this copper rough and tough, you can definitely wear this as a manual job work boot uh, if your job doesn't require protective toes because this does not have a steel toe cap. It's tough enough to wear digging things and making things on the job site and the grippy lugged sole gives a comfortable good grip. It's also quite a versatile casual boot, versatile in the whole casual wear spectrum, uh, but not in any business casual sense. So, not for going into a professional office, but pretty much capable of being brushed up after work and meeting the mates at the pub for a drink or uh, going to the local trattoria with your spouse or uh, even going to friends for a barbecue or a picnic. It's suitable to go for a walk, take your dog, or even with some comfort reservations, uh, going on a longish forest trail hike. That means it's versatile enough to wear with jeans. And personally, in this color, I think any kind of jeans from regular cut to slim and tapered, cuffed or not cuffed, uh, light or dark wash, ripped or unripped, not my style ripped, um, denim suits this boot like gin does with tonic really. At the same time, you can pair these with earth tones like browns and khakis, as well as neutral tones like black and navy, and even white trousers if you're that way inclined. Up top, because of the overall casual vibe, They'd go with anything from a t-shirt over ripped jeans to a smart Oxford cloth button down uh, over khaki chinos maybe, layered with a rough textured sports coat, uh, or maybe a chore coat and an overshirt, uh, or the good old fashioned leather jacket even. In fact, taking this hardy, tough design in leather, not much you can't wear it with um, other than a suit. Do not wear it with a suit. Now let's take a look at the construction of these boots. Uh, and for those of you new to boots, I'll explain some of the terms I used earlier. For those of you who know this already, bear with me. Taking a look at the bottom, these outsoles are from Vibram, 
their Mini Lug Sol, model number 430. Vibram is an Italian company started by Vitali Bramani in the 1930s when a number of his mountaineering friends died on a climb and he always maintained that if they had had good boots with grippy soles, they would not have fallen to their deaths. So he invented the rubber commando sole. You'd recognize this pattern anywhere. Radiating lugs at the outside of the sole and in the center, a series of star-shaped studs. The original commando sole has very deep lugs, uh, affording great grip, especially outdoors. These are the mini lug version in that the lugs are shorter and they're kind of recessed into a hollow in the center of the sole. This gives them superior grip while at the same time looking slim and sleek, especially from the side, allowing the boot to be worn in more casual and less worky situations without actually standing out. The rubber compound is oil resistant, hardy, yet with enough give so that uh, you don't feel like you're walking on studded wood. The heel is a one piece solid rubber block heel. And while it has a red wing logo, I'm pretty sure it's also by Vibram. The sole is attached to the uppers using the Goodyear welt construction method. This is where a strip of leather or other similar material called the welt goes around the circumference of the boot. This one has a leather welt. The inside edge of the welt is sewn to the uppers on the inside and the outside edge of the welt is sewn uh, onto the sole construction. This one is a 270 degree Goodyear welt as opposed to a 360 degree Goodyear welt. In the 270 degree Goodyear welt, rather than have the welt go all the way around the boot, it goes about three quarters of the way around the front of the boot. The advantages of a Goodyear welt construction is that it is uh, easily recraftable and it's more water resistant. The stitches and glue holding the outsole to the rest of the boot can be taken apart and the outsole replaced without touching and, and possibly damaging the uppers. Since the stitches holding the sole to the uppers and the uppers to the sole are different and none of them go all the way through the boot from the inside to the outside, the welt then forms a barrier. There's less of a chance of water that wicks through the boot through a stitch hole because there isn't one that goes all the way through. The disadvantage of a Goodyear welt is that it's a little more clunky. You can see the evident ledge that kind of juts out. Uh, it works for uh, work or service boots, but not so much for dressier boots and shoes. In, in fact, that's why some boots, su uh, such as these, are 270 degree Goodyear welted. The heel portion is glued and nailed and not sewn through uh, an intervening welt. This allows the back of the boot, down to the heel, to keep a sleek, smooth line without a ledge sticking out. Now, moving up inside the boot, if you think about it, if you sew a thick leather welt around the edge of the boot, you're going to create a cavity or depression in the middle of the boot, right? In these boots, that cavity is filled with cork and then a thick three or four mil thick insole is put on top. This combination of leather and cork inside the boot is the boot enthusiast's ideal combination because both materials are meant to compress with your weight and shape the insole into the negative image of your feet. So making it more comfortable as if the boots were tailor-made for your feet. Inside the cork layer is embedded a triple rib steel shank. Not very airport friendly, but at twice the width of normal steel shanks, they give you super support under the arch, bridging that gap between heel and foot pad, and they give you strong torsion stability on rough ground or going up ladders. Still inside, there's a leather heel pad with the Red Wing logo embossed for extra comfort at the heel and to protect your heel from the clinch nails driven through uh, to hold the heel on securely. The uppers are made from SB foot tannings, copper rough and tough leather. I've seen it described as full grain oil tanned leather, but I've also seen it described as distressed waxy nubuck. Looking at it, I tend toward a slightly distressed oil nubuck. I can see the grain texture of the cow on the surface, uh, it hasn't been sanded and buffed very much like I expect Newbuck to be. Uh, and in fact, it seems very similar to the waxy, slightly corrected grain that's crazy horse leather, uh, which is a kind of Newbuck. If you know for sure what it is, I mean for sure, let me know in the comments below. In this copper color, it's a beautiful leather and it patinas at a glance. Patina is the texture and variation that leather takes on with wear and boot collectors treasure this as a way of individualizing the boots that you own. Uh, in some lights it's a dirty brown, in other lights it's a reddish tarnished copper color, 
uh, like copper pipes that you've left in the weather. Whatever it is, full grain or new bar, it is super, super tough. The design is a simple four pieces of two to two and a quarter mil thick leather made up of the vamp and the toe box, the two quarters and a single piece backstay. Very elegant because of the simplicity, despite the work boot aesthetic. Very simple lines emphasized by the contrasting white stitching, uh, double stitch everywhere except for the famous Red Wing triple pilgrim stitch at the quarters. The pilgrim stitching machine stitches all three threads at the same time, forming a complicated looping stitch. It's so rare and so old that Red Wing's machines are maintained by their own specialized maintenance force. The boot is mainly unlined uh, except for a canvas lining in the vamp and toe box. I believe the toe structure is held up in this bump toe with a leather toe stiffener, while the internal heel counter in here is a compressed cardboard heel counter. The internal heel counter is covered on the inside by a piece of rough out or suede to, to catch on your sock. The toe stiffener and the heel counter maintain the shape of the boot and helps your heels stick snugly in place. The boot features four brass eyelets, uh, three brass speed hooks, generously sized but not backed, uh, just pressed in and the hardware splayed out at the back to hold them onto the leather. The tongue is semi-gusseted up to that first speed hook. This makes it very secure and it doesn't slip around like on some boots. Finishing at the top, the collar is finished off with a rolled leather edge. Being a rough and tough leather, I found that this leather doesn't need a lot of care. Uh, whatever it is, it is definitely oil tanned because I can feel that it's almost pull up, packed with oils inside and the surface is moist and waxy. I have given these a light wipe with Timberland's new buck conditioner, but mostly these have just been brushed uh, and brushed and brushed. I, I don't re really recommend a waxy conditioner because even if it isn't new buck, it has a dry paperish texture and you do not want to put a layer of wax on top of it. Honestly, I find that brushing has been the best maintenance for these boots because of the oil that's in them. I can almost see the oils and waxes moving around and clean up the surface of the boots and just brushing develops the highs and lows uh, that create these dark and light patches and brings out the patina that's so looked for. However, sometimes, particularly if you use these as work boots, I don't, uh, you will need to clean them and if you do, or if the leather eventually dries and feels dry, you will have to condition them. There's only so much brushing can do. So, the leather is tough enough to clean them with saddle soap. Make sure you brush loose dirt and sand off first. You do not want to combine the grit from that sand with sticky stuff like saddle soap or conditioners that forms an abrasive grease. That would be the death of the leather. My method of saddle soaping is to use an applicator brush and lather up in the tin and then brush over sections of the boot in a circular motion then wipe that section dry before I move on to the next section. I don't rinse the soap off because it has waxes in the soap and most saddle soaps aren't full of glycerin like hand soaps. As for conditioning, well, you can't go wrong using Red Wing leather care products on a Red Wing boot. But the only word of warning I have is not to use their leather oil or mink oil. Both will significantly darken the leather. If you care more for waterproof protection maybe uh, than the look, then well, okay. But if you care about this color and want to protect it for as long as possible, I use their boot cream, the one with Neat's Foot oil in it. For myself, uh, I used Big Four on these before, which do not darken the leather. I think Big Four doesn't penetrate as deep as Red Wing's oils or creams, so it's probably not as waterproof and I probably have to apply it more often, but I don't mind. Uh, boot care is quite meditative and I'm not intending to wade across a river in these for that amount of waterproof. Um, I'll put a few links to the products in the description below. How about sizing? As I said earlier, these are made in the Red Wing number no. 8 last. A last is the usually wooden mold that's in the shape of the, uh, uh, the foot, but it's also in the shape of the ultimate shape of the boot. Uh, so a last can have a bulbous toe box and a shapely heel, or it can be very sleek and slim at the toes and tuck in at the waist uh, and so on. The shape of the last is ultimately what defines the shape of the boot as it's made. The boot maker, or machine if it's factory made, pulls the leather around the last to get the shape, fixes it to the last tightly while he then attaches the insole. 
uh, and then once released, the leather takes on the shape of the design. Anyway, the Red Wing number no. 8 last is quite a roomy last. My true Brannock size, forget sneaker sizes, go and get your proper size measured at a shoe store. My true Brannock size is an 8.5D in US sizing. The D signifies width, which for me is average. UK sizes are one number down and their width letters are all over the place, but generally an average width is a G. In most American heritage boots, they size half a size large and so I got an 8D in these. Same as my Iron Rangers and my 6 inch classic mock toes, even though those are on a different last. In these blacksmiths, they fit about the same as the Iron Ranger, fits nicely and no tightness at all. They're roomy in the toes, loose but not floppy in the waist and the heel. I prefer a more snug fit and I like to feel like my boots are hugging my feet, but I don't think I could have gone a half, uh, uh, another half size down. To get to the fit I like, I put in a slightly padded removable insole in both these and the Iron Rangers, or if I take those out and I wear very thick boot socks. The arch support is pretty good once I snug them up and I, I feel supported in the ankles. The soles, even without the padded insoles, feel comfortable uh, and honestly, the more I wear them and the more my feet put in an impression into the leather and cork, the more comfy I feel in them. I have worn them for a nearly full day's walk in the forest reserve, uh, perhaps not very challenging terrain, but I didn't feel any discomfort. The low mini lugs d don't feel like they're pushing up into my feet or anything, so they're quite comfortable. Now, these are bought lightly used from eBay, so it's probably unfair to discuss break-in, but I believe they were so lightly used that I can almost treat them as new. Um, so my impression of nearly out of the box is pretty good. The leather, while tough, is supple, uh, so no experience of that leather digging in or anything. There were no hot spots and no real heel slip, mostly I think because they are the right size, uh, often the key to a good break-in. If you're not at all sure about sizing, get some advice from Red Wing or try Grail & Co. That's um, G-R-A-Y-L-E dot co. It's a website that collects reviews and sizing data from loads of people across different boots and makeups. The stats go toward averaging out the experience and offering you a size for your feet in a particular boot. Uh, the more people who enter a review and the stats, the more accurate uh, that sizing will be. So go check it out, G-R-A-Y-L-E dot co. As I said, I bought these on eBay. I have a little checklist that I go through uh, to do a due diligence on secondhand boots, which so far has held up for me, uh, except on a couple of occasions when my desire for a boot got the better of my due diligence process and my common sense. Uh, if you'd like to know what I look for, let me know in the comments below and I'll do a video on it. Anyway, I checked that these were hardly used, not even lightly used. The heel was in really good nick, the sole as you can see is hardly marked, and there were no foot marks in the leather insole. I got them for just over 200 Aussie dollars, a steal when they sell brand new here for over 560 Aussie. So for me, the cost was a steal, but what about if you bought them new? Well, I think in the US they sell for about 300 US dollars, so let's take that for a measure. What do you get? You get a heritage maker's design and make construction. You get a really good leather and quality materials for the sole, insole and overall in construction, uh, including that triple ribbed steel shank. You get Goodyear welted, which is like the gold mark of boots. Okay, it is produced in the thousands, so maybe QC can be a little bit slippery. I haven't seen that in this boot, by the way, but I've heard that um, mistakes happen. Leather selection can be a bit iffy and stitching can be a little slipshod. All in all though, uh, as a US $300 boot, there's not that many to beat it, especially if you like this bump toe work boot design. In Australia at 560 bucks, that's a bit more iffy. You're starting to compare them in price with RM Williams and all that refined boot making that goes into those, uh, even into their work boots. Uh, I didn't and I would not buy them new in Australia, so finding an almost untouched pair on eBay at $200, it's fantastic. I'm not saying the exact uh, bargain is available, but you have to look, don't you? So there you have it. The Red Wing Blacksmith, model 3343 in copper rough and tough. I hope you liked the review. Let me know in the comments below. 
And don't forget to please click on the like button if you like the video. It will help me get this video out to more people who might like to see it and it will help me grow my channel. And if you haven't already, by the way, please click on the subscribe, uh, especially if you want to see more boot reviews. I will be bringing you more boot reviews and unboxing videos and whatever else as I go, so don't miss out on them. Until then, take care and I'll see you soon.